They say that um, from small acorns, great oak trees grow. And I use this analogy to emphasize the point that from meager and very small beginnings, a message of hope, uh, a message of awareness about all of the problems that face society, any society, any community in the world, um, and a vision for humanity can actually spread. Uh, not just the message itself, but also the, the physical action and the willingness required to address the particular problem. About three years ago, uh, a group of friends in Kuala Lumpur started talking about their concern. They have a common concern about the matter of rural uh, and urban poverty uh, here in Malaysia, and particularly in Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital city, where the perception is that the streets are paved with gold. And their vision was quite clear. It was to provide sustenance to those that are hungry or those that were thirsty. It was how to get them off the streets, how to get them back into society as contributing citizens, and also how to stem the flow of those that were finding themselves homeless or in poverty. And I became involved uh, with this group of people, um, and we commenced a street program of feeding on a Saturday um, here in Kuala Lumpur. And I'm very fortunate because I work uh, with a tremendous uh, group of human beings uh, from all religions, from all cultures, from all societies, from all backgrounds, from all age groups. These people are true volunteers. They have normal day jobs, they have a life and a material life the same as the rest of us, and they give up their time to come and do this for the society uh, in which they live and which they work. Over seven main routes within the city limits and on four days each week, uh, we hit the streets and we now feed over a thousand people uh, every week. And we administer street medicine, we try to use uh, traditional methods wherever possible. For example, we use uh, fresh ginger to deal with uh, dry throats and coughs. We try not to put um, medicines onto the street. There are enough medicines out there already uh, without us putting any more onto it. And also some of the people that we treat uh, do have narcotic habits. Uh, and if you start giving them additional, you don't know what you're doing to them. So we try to use traditional methods wherever we can. If we don't have sponsored food, we do have some sponsored food, we buy it ourselves. We use our own vehicles. And we have no overheads. And we are, as I said, volunteers, true volunteers in the sense of the word. And in fact, because we don't have an office, um, you could say that we're probably homeless as well as the people that we serve. <laughs> this truly is, and I hate to use this, it's very corny, this truly is one Malaysia in action. When you see the volunteers from all the different backgrounds giving up their time, there is no agenda. There's no political agenda, there is no religious agenda, there is no individual agenda for doing it. It truly is uh, a One Malaysia in action. Oops. What I found when we try to raise awareness about the poverty issue is that there's often an unwillingness to admit that, or accept, that there is a problem of urban and rural poverty here in Malaysia. I have had on one particular occasion uh, quite a senior member of government uh, talk to me, sort of, with his finger in my face, saying to me, there are no homeless people in Kuala Lumpur. You must understand this. I don't know whether it was because I was a foreigner or whether it was because he really believed that. So the problem is, I then said to him, here are some photographs of the people that are on the street. And again, he denied that they existed. So I then said to him, come with me now five minutes from here and I will walk you and I will introduce you to some of these people that don't exist. And he walked away. <laughs> Admission means action. Action means spending money. And therein lies the problem. A recent statistic stated that the government uh, is on a drive to reduce hardcore poverty in Malaysia to 2.8% 
by the end of this year. The actual number is, is not really known. Even we uh, working on the streets don't really know what the exact problem is, the exact number of people who are in hardcore poverty. But if we use the 2.8% as a benchmark, that equates to, uh, from a population of 27.7 million people in the country, over 770,000 people who are recognized as hardcore poor. 770,000 people. And that's a population that is larger than the cities of Sandakan, or Kodabaru, or Kuala Tranganu, or Alasita, or Malacca, or Seremban, or Shah Alam, or Kota Kinabalu, or Penang. And in fact, that population of 2.8%, uh, sorry, the population of 770,000, is actually larger than the entire population of the state of Perlis. It puts it at number two in the populations of national cities. Only Kuala Lumpur has a higher population. It has 1.6 million people. The statistics are produced by the Malaysian government's Department of Statistics. And the 2.8% was a statistic produced by the Minister for Women, Children and Community Developments just recently. I get tremendously frustrated. I see welfare being provided at 70 ringgit per head per person per month, when everybody knows that a viable, sustainable income in Kuala Lumpur is 500 ringgit per month per head. Now, I'm no way suggesting that we should have a welfare state in Malaysia, in fact, quite the opposite. But if there is a problem, and it's clear that there is a problem, then there must be a concerted and focused effort uh, to address it. And regrettably, we see more and more people coming onto the streets of Kuala Lumpur and from a more wide geographical area. And these are Malaysian citizens. These are not Indonesians, Bangladeshis, Thais, anybody else. These are Malaysian citizens that we serve. We have people living in the open from virtually every state in the country. Men, women, boys, girls, families. Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, free thinkers, the old, the young, families, and the whole range of humanity. Street feeding is not the answer. It is purely addressing a symptom. And we found through our experiences that the cause is urban and rural poverty. Um, other symptoms are things like domestic violence. Uh, we have women uh, who live in staircases in Puduraya, the main bus terminal. Malay girls in Tudongs living in there because they have been subject to abuse or they have been abandoned. We support training centers for young Malaysian girls who also uh, have been the subject of abuse, exploitation, discrimination, and they have nowhere to go. And we're also involved in campaigns to raise the awareness of such issues and to try and have this addressed, together with many other NGOs working to the same objectives. We've commenced education programs for underprivileged kids to get them out of the poverty cycle and to try and give them the knowledge and the skills to be employable and therefore economically secure in their future as they grow older. Uh, education is one of the key symptoms that needs to be addressed. I refer to symptoms a lot, because people sometimes don't actually understand. It's the same as having a flu. If you have a flu, you have a sore throat, you have a runny nose, you have a fever, you have a cough. But the cause is the flu virus. The cough, the, 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 cough, the sneezing, the runny nose, the fever are purely symptoms. In the same way that street feeding, education programs and awareness uh, programs are actually the things that are getting to the root cause, which is urban and rural poverty. Connecting folks to homes and to societies to shelter them um, is something that is fantastic. That is a great thing to do. But what we have to give is inspiration, not charity. Because I'm inspired by them to work actually harder, um, to care more 
And that's what our people actually do. We inspire. Charity you give, inspire you trying to teach the guy to fish. And my life has changed significantly. Whenever I'm out in KL, I'm always looking out for where street folks gather and where we can go to help them. I'm looking out for jobs for them. I'm looking out where there are situations that as a, a society, not the organization I work for, but the society can actually help those that are less fortunate. We can never give up. We can never accept that what we do is enough. And we do it for them. We don't do it for some self-cherishing ego because there are no heroes medals in what we do. And that's the way that it should be. I've lost street friends. Those who've succumbed to alcohol, narcotics, or just the ravages of a, a street existence. And I've cried at the loss of every single one of them. Siva used to beg at the bottom of an escalator at one of the rapid transit stations here in KL. He couldn't walk and he was fitted with a, a colostomy bag, but he's one of the most incredibly cheerful people um, that I've ever had the pleasure to meet. Many times I've treated him for the beatings that he's received uh, while he lived this street existence. Uh, Siva was actually pretty, pretty drunk the last time uh, that I saw him. A friend of his had got some very potent street alcohol. I mean, even stuff a Scotsman wouldn't touch, right? <laughs> this was deadly, deadly serious booze. Siva had his begging bowl turned upside down. He was beating it as a drum, and his friend was dancing round about. Both of them, Siva was an Indian gentleman, his friend was Chinese, were belting out some incomprehensible Bollywood-style song in Hindi and Mandarin at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. It was hilarious. And it was one of those, you know, great Kodak moments. Siva died three days later, alone, and on the street. And these are the guys that have slipped through the cracks. And the cracks are getting wider. And more are falling through, regrettably. I'm often asked, why? Why do I feed people? Why am I continuing to support a, a culture of idleness? And it's very simple. Because the vision about feeding is actually to help stem the flow by forming relationships interrogating the skill base that the homeless possess, and by doing so, to see where we can place them into employment. That is the end game. I'm asked why I feed everybody. Now again, it's very simple. Um, if you x-ray a stomach, it doesn't tell you it's a Chinese stomach, or an Indian stomach, or a Malay stomach, or a Scotsman stomach. It tells you it is an empty stomach. Poverty and hunger know no barrier. It exists, and it's not a figment of anyone's imagination. The people you see in the photos during this presentation this morning are real. Come with me, and I will show you anytime. And we do this to inspire others in the way that we and I have been inspired by the survival of our street friends every day. But we can't do this alone. But the good news is, the times, they are changing. The light is now starting to shine on this issue after some time. We've been fortunate enough as a group in the last few weeks, <coughs> excuse me, to engage the government and like-minded organizations such as uh, the Ministry for Women, Children and Community Development, uh, Pamuda Umno, uh, with Tunku Asman, uh, Yayasan Kabajikan Nagara, uh, to name just one or two uh, organizations, who are now coming with us on the streets almost on a daily basis to see what we can do to address the problem. The Ministry of uh, Human Resources have also joined us on the streets to see how we can get people employed. And we're now starting to see some headway. The numbers are reducing. And this is incredible. 
because with this new strategy, Malaysia actually can now become a model for developing countries and how to provide a safety net for all of these social issues that we're actually facing here without the requirement to establish a welfare state. And this is what Malaysia needs, in the opinion of a humble foreigner. To change the acceptance that abnormal behaviour is permissible, such as violence to those that are vulnerable, we need to turn the tables. We need to turn it through action and through awareness. We need to be disgusted. We need to be distressed by the abnormal behaviour of others and not just accept it and do nothing about it. We need to raise the awareness of the causes of so much suffering and actively eradicate the symptoms with all of our effort. We need to open our eyes and admit that there is a problem. And that's why I'm blessed to have such an amazing and compassionate group of people to work to, together with who dedicate their time to these particular ideals. Thank you for listening to our story. And thank you.